Hello, everybody. Welcome to Staffing in Sync, the podcast that brings you live panel discussions featuring the leading experts in the staffing industry. My name is Tom Erb, and today our session is all about recruiting internal talent. So a pretty hot topic right now. I'm excited to introduce our guests. We have Robin Mee and Kim Whiteley of Me Derby and Jim Hunter of PeopleBest. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So Robin, if you want to kick us off. All right. Thank you, Tom. And uh, appreciate being here. Me Derby is an executive search firm that I founded 35 years ago. We specialize in search for the workforce solutions ecosystem. So we are all staffing all the time and internal talent acquisition is, you know, what we talk about 24 hours a day. So excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Kim? Hi, Kim Whiteley. And yes, thank you. Excited to be here as well. President of Me Derby. And as Robin shared, we are an executive search firm for the staffing and workforce solutions industry. You know, have traditionally done management and executive level search in the industry, but last year launched a division to do individual contributors. So feel like this panel is definitely right in our sweet spot and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Kim. Jim? Thanks very much. Um, Jim Hunter, I'm the founder and CEO of PeopleBest. Uh, we've been around for 20, about 20 years. Well, coming up on 20 years next, next year. So our software combines uh, behaviors and analytics to predict success of people inside of jobs and companies. And so we're kind of a the picture, if you will, the psychology meets money ball. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we've worked with clients uh, worldwide and have been working with Tom specifically for well over a decade. So yeah. super excited to be here. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, everybody. Um, I do want to tell the people who are joining us live that if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take questions. That's what we always do if you've been on any of these before, uh, is we spend most of the time answering questions. So if you do have any, put them into the Q&A section. I'll be keeping my eyes open on that, and uh, we'll introduce those as we get a chance. But why don't we start off... Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've been uh, in the industry for 30 years. I've been consulting to the industry for 14. Eight of that, I had my own search firm for the for the industry as well. Um, I feel like we have the cobbler's kid shoes syndrome in our industry, right? Where, you know, our whole reason for being is to find people for our clients and yet when it comes to internal hiring, uh, we tend to make a lot of the same mistakes that our clients make. Um, so I'll open it up. What are some of the challenges that you're just seeing with uh, with organizations out there when it comes to internal hiring? Well, Whoever would like to take it on. Sure, I'll kick it off. Um, you know, the challenges are constant. And even though we've been in, this, in, in our industry in a downturn, uh, some companies more impacted than others, but for the last, what, 19 months, the internal hiring has continued and it's continued in spite of organizational um, uh, reductions. Uh, and, and that has been, again, across every vertical of staffing. So even though there's more talent out there, there are, and so that means more candidates in the market, they're going, they're, they're finding new jobs quickly. We're seeing um, an uptick right now. We've had consistent hiring um, in the Me Derby world for, for the last 19 months, um, the sales and sales leadership positions being the hottest. Um, you know, a lot of companies were so focused on recruiting for the five years before this that a lot of companies took the eye, their eye off the ball on the sales side. And so um, the, the pace of hiring for both upskilling and just filling that sales funnel. So more, you know, more feet on the street, more people selling, staffing, and it is, um, and it's it starting. We're starting to see candidates having multiple offers, candidates getting uh, counter offers again, and so, you know, the competitiveness for top talent is constant. So, and 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 frankly, having an internal talent acquisition strategy uh, combined with you know a very strong digital marketing um, uh, and brand identity, and then you know using partners to help identify the best talent so you can fill, you know, as quickly as possible that time to that time to fill. I think in the, the last the last 19 months has elongated, but again, we're starting to see a quicker pace of hire as I think we're starting to 
feel and some companies feeling some recovery in the market. Yeah. Kim, how about you? Well, I, I think, you know, specifically some of the challenges we see, especially at that sales level is because across, you know, several of the verticals, the industry has been down a little bit. To some extent, they're expecting these people to come in and perform miracles in less than 90 days and be producing revenue and even interviewing to that. And, you know, we we have a client, unfortunately, where people drop out of the interview process because a statement gets made to them that, you know, you're expected to close a large deal within 90 days on board. And, and it's not just that client. It is, right. the, I'm calling it the white knight syndrome where, you right. know, hires unrealistic expectations of performance because expecting of sales to be the silver bullet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Expecting sales to be the sil silver bullet and, you know, them, them being able to, you know, and the question is coming back around. Uh, we see it from so many clients. Can they bring a book of business? Yeah. Well, do you want your person leaving <laughs> and taking, I mean, it's just, yeah, uh, book of business is the most overrated thing. It is, yeah. You know, first of all, if they really truly do have a book of business, it's probably likely you can't afford to pull them away. Uh, not to mention, for now, we still have the non competes. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, we'll see what happens with that. But but uh, for now, you know, we've still got those. So I have seen people overpay for a quote book of business that after two weeks was dried up. Well, uh, right. and, and yep. even with the non, even if the non-compete ban does eventually go into effect, the non-solicit part will remain. We expect, sure. and so sure. that bringing a book of business just, you know, isn't a reality until that non-solicit period is over. Yeah, yeah. And, and going back to Kim, what you were talking about with um, just the unrealistic expectations, I, I have companies come to us all the time to talk about, we need sales fast. What can we do to do sales fast? And I go, if there was a way to do sales fast, everybody do it all the time, right? I mean, it's 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 like, it's not, there's not an easier way to do it. There is no silver bullet. It's like, it's the whole adage of, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. You know, second best time is today. And that's what they're doing with sales. I stopped selling for several years because I had people literally calling into the office, placing orders, not necessarily good orders, but placing right. orders. So, so yeah, with those fighting those unrealistic expectations. And then as you alluded to the candidates get a whiff of that and they go, I don't need that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Tom, you, as you're talking about, you know, we're the cobbler's kids. It's like, well, there must be a whole lot of shoe stores and shoe companies out there because we see whatever we're seeing in the staffing industry, we see across the board. And I echo what Robin and Kim are saying, especially to Tom, what you were talking about on sales, you know, overnight sales. Um, you know, we we predict success of salespeople. We, we can even measure how much they're going to sell. Like we, we got this down. And I will tell you that, you know, in all my years of running big sales organizations, you know, I'm an old sales guy from L.A., and it's you can't you can't expect it overnight. You know, it's at best, and we'll talk about onboarding too, because I think that's a huge subject in and of itself. But two quick points are, you know, you have to measure, you know, it's calls plus appointments equals sales, the old adage, or you know, calls plus rings, you know, calls plus presentations, anything like that, that all those adages hold true. So you got to, you have to measure the activity. And the one thing is you got it. And then, so it goes back to your first question. That's the, the, the main point that I want to make is talking about cobblers, you know, the cobbler's kids. I, I just think that we're so quick to want results, you know, sales included, that mm -hmm. just don't slow down to understand what we really need. And, you know, the old adage of measure twice, cut once, right? And yeah. so not even getting close to understanding what we truly need. We're chasing the business of the day and expecting miracles overnight. And so it's just, it's a thoughtful process that transcends through the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure too, so. I think we need to have an adage tracker for this uh, call. We're already on two adages and cobbler's uh, <laughs> kid shoes, cut twice or cut once. Oh no, we'll, we'll yeah. throw on, don't worry oh, yeah, about that. No. So, measure twice, it's time to once. plant a tree. Yeah, it, it, you know, the other, it, and it, it goes to what Jim's saying, um, I find the number one 
issue that we have is that, that we don't really know what we want. And in a lot of cases, we we don't know what we want in the position. We don't know what the what success looks like in the position. Um, and so what inevitably happens, whether it's a sales position, a recruiter, a manager, or a leader, what, whatever, is, um, you know, we get an out-of-date job description that we have sitting around, maybe try and update it a little bit and throw a job posting out on Indeed. And then we, you know, we just take whatever comes from that pool of candidates. And then there's no real understanding of, of how do we even screen them? What are we looking for? And so we see that quite a bit uh, over, over time. What, what other challenges are you seeing out there? Well, I think, Tom, you, you hit the nail on the head by saying, you know, we don't even know what we're looking for. We put a job posting out there, which then very quickly transcends to the interview process. So, you know, it, it we see a lot of clients start with what I'll call kind of a disjointed inter process, interview process yeah. that ends up not being the same for every candidate. It's not structured. And so I think along with a very good job description and metrics for the position, there has to be a very structured interview process. And especially if you're going to involve multiple people in the firm in the interview process, it shouldn't just be a regurg. You know, the second interview is not just a regurgitation of the first interview. The second right. interview, you should assign whatever manager you're having interview. Okay, these are the four things I want you to cover in the interview. I did this. I want you to do this. And you right. carry that theme throughout the interview process. But you also shorten your interview process. Yeah. You know, we're we're seeing, you know, when when you allow two weeks to occur in between first and second and thirds, because you're saying people's calendars are getting in the way. I think if you're hiring for a position, the other early on conversation you have to have with your teams involved in the interview process is, are we ready to hire for this position? And is everybody available over the next month for interviews? Yeah. Because if you're not, you're not truly ready and you just continue to lose candidates throughout the process. So, yeah. And, and you have to sell throughout the whole process until you decide that that's not the candidate. Yeah. Right. What they, a lot of companies make the mistake of they come at it with, well, prove to me that you are worthy of joining our organization. And you're going, what decade are you in right now? These the best candidates have lots of choices. We need to be selling them on our opportunity up until the point where we go, okay, I don't think actually this is the right fit. Then we can then we back off and say, okay, let's move on. But in so many cases, it's more of a prove it approach with the candidate. And I, I find I, I'd like to know, Robin and Kim, what you are seeing. But I have found in my experience that in a lot of cases we tend to overvalue behaviors that unemployed and highly active candidates exhibit. Like, like, well, they didn't seem like they wanted the job, right? Yeah, you know, your, your unemployed people, they're going to be falling all over themselves for the job. And, or, well, they didn't, they didn't send me a follow-up and all that. Are you seeing that as well? Well, it, not only that, but take it a step further. And that is not only do you have to continue to sell your organization and position your organization as a, you know, as a pre premium brand and why, you know, we're courting these people, but it doesn't even end at the offer. It needs to continue between that, that delicate period between the offer and the start date. We are, that is when candidates are getting counter offers. That is when they're getting other offers. And, and it is just the beginning of the rest of this relationship that is just established in this beginning. But I also do want to mention, and I think this is true for all size companies, that it's got to come from a hiring strategy to begin with. I know even at Main mm -hmm. Derby, we can be reactive. We, we've met somebody, we've interviewed somebody, and gosh, they could be good for us. But stepping back and really thinking strategically about what we're looking to accomplish, what that profile is. Yes, I mean, I think it's important to have an assemblance of a job description um, and the ones that are super actionable that have you know metrics and KPIs associated with them all the better. But so that everybody is is really marching to, to the same beat. So you're so you're 
So you know what the strategy is and you're looking, your hiring is going to accomplish that. And you can take that from a small company to a large company. But I think starting with the strategy is super important. Uh, here's, here's the pro tip of the day. Um, if you don't know what you want, look at what you have. I don't know if that's an, I don't know if that Tom, if that fits into the yeah, I can't. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, that's what we do. That's what we've done with Tom in looking at the recruiting industry. We look at where who's doing it right. And there's your model. There's your right. model. And then what's interesting is everybody talks about a job description. Um, which it does needs it needs to be accurate, but that can be written off the back of what success looks like in your own organization. Because our philosophy is every job is unique because because every company is unique, and so what makes your culture different than anybody else? But here's pro tip number two: is find out what else the successful people do in their spare time. So we're we're finding fascinating information on job applications uh, because we you know um, i'm almost done with a blog that says the death of the resume because if you think about it chat gpt is the best resume writer and you okay. know god's green earth right and but you can't but on a job application it's like do you have outside interests you know what are your hobbies you know anything like that that can be stellar information and Kim and Robin was talking about the, the interview process. Um, there's gold in there. There is absolute gold. If those questions are consistent, this is that's pro tip number three on the interview questions is if they're super consistent where they're always asking the same thing, all of this data gets smarter as you go. And so you start to see who comes, you start to see who goes, and all of this data helps you determine what really works so i was we uh, just oh, elaborate it... for a second on those the hobbies idea like what somebody does outside of work and how you is bet. that relevant in the in the interview process and the you hire bet. so if you want somebody that's outgoing gregarious uh good with people we've we found this in a multitude of different jobs um behavioral interventionists people that go into homes with for autistic services but if they if they spend their time with outside organizations, social clubs, um, faith-based clubs, uh, volunteering, coaching, um, any other hobbies, there's just that innateness that they give of themselves. And so that's that clicks a lot of those mm -hmm. buttons of what you would want in a particular person. Got um, it. Thank you. Quick, quick Thank sidebar to that. We always work with clients and they're like, oh, we just love this candidate. And I look at their profile and I'm like, they did the best job interview of all the candidates, right? And they're like, yeah. And they're really nice, right? Yeah. He said, well, that's, your, that's your, you know, you can hire a golden retriever if you want a friend. But if you need somebody to do it, they don't have that horsepower inside. And Tom, I think that's what you were talking about as well. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, Jim, I, I, think I think a huge, a huge mistake that, I see over and over again is hiring people because we like them Amen. as opposed to exactly. hiring people because they can do the job well. And a lot of that is because most people don't do behavioral interview questions. Um, I have done a lot of uh, training in that area and I was training a team of about 30 recruiters. And I was telling this story of, I was training another group of people and nobody knew what behavioral interviewing was. And I was telling this group of 30 recruiters about how this other group didn't know what behavioral interviewing and I'm looking out at all these blank faces. I'm going, you don't know what behavioral interviewing is either, do you? And they go, no, we don't know what it is. For those of you who don't know what it is, behavioral interviewing is asking a question where they give a specific example of where they have exhibited the behavior before. And, and we just find that that is, you know, brings out, okay, are they likely to do it again? You know, past past uh, behaviors is most indicative of future behaviors, right? Um, but then also it ties into what you're talking about, Jim, which is identifying what are the behaviors we want them to even do and and what are we what are we wanting them to to focus on? So, well, right, and I think, I think you as you're as you're interviewing for sales and recruiters specifically, 
And, you know, Jim, you bring up such a great point in Tom as well. And the, but I really liked them. They had a great voice. They were articulate. Yeah. Did you get into any of the questions, behavioral and metric driven of how many weeks out of the quarter did you meet your metrics? And on the weeks that you didn't meet your metrics, tell me what happened those weeks. How are you ranked across the region, state, country against your peers? It, you learn a lot from asking those kinds of direct questions because what I have found is people that are high performers, they know exactly where they're ranked. They know exactly what their numbers are and how many weeks they've met their metrics versus weeks that they have not. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, top performers tend to um, measure themselves based on numbers, particularly in sales, right? right? Is you And you look at a resume that is all tactical, task-oriented, I did this, 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 and this, that's if they've been do, doing six sales for a period of time, it's a pretty good indication that they didn't necessarily have much results or that they didn't focus on the results. Whereas a top performer, you'll see, I ranked number three out of 73 reps in the country. I, I exceeded quota by 137% my first year, right? Those are the types of things that we see. Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Attitude blows away the uh, book of business too, by the way, rolling back the discussion clock. Yeah. Time and again. So um, let's let's kind of flip this. And, and in the meantime, just to remind the people that are on live with us, if you have questions, you know, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll be happy to answer the questions. Um, let's flip this. So we talked about the challenges. What are the best organizations, the organizations that seem to really have it down? And, and we do see organizations like that where everybody we meet, we go, wow, this person's sharp, right? There are just certain organizations that seem to have it down more than others. W what are they doing? I'll, I'll start with Jim. Um, know what they want and set the expectations. We, we, we kind of talked about this already, but to double down on, on some of it, they're very clear of what they need. Um, they've got, you know, their their personas are well developed around the the typical clients that they are working with. Um, they know what they need inside of a particular person, but they also, and this gets into a whole discussion about onboarding and Kim and Robin are the the pros pros, but it's just understanding that metric that they need to be producing very quickly um, because a lot of times we see clients, it's entertaining somebody about their benefits and all of these different things and getting their laptop going. Yeah, 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 that's important, but they need to be out doing it. And I think the best companies have that kind of mutual expectation of each other. You know, we want you to rip it. We're going to help you to rip it and be very successful but you want to you need to have that uh passion fire and energy as much as we want to you know provide that to you so i think those without that then mm -hmm. you're just mixing around and now you're carrying the c players and the man you know and everybody's trying to help the c players be better when they should be out the door and sorry to be brass tacks but having been around the you know, the hiring and firing circle too much. It's just not fair to people if this isn't the job for them. And, you know, and so I think, I think those two things um, jump out as, uh, you know, as what, what I think separates the really good companies from the other ones. I, uh, I interviewed a candidate yesterday who said, these are the 10 companies in my industry, in my particular area of staffing, that are showing the fastest growth. And I want to be part of a company that is growing like that. So these are the companies I've got relationships in. Who do you have relationships with? It was all about growth for her. Mm -hmm. And in, it, it, particularly a um, staffing industry analyst does a lot of that kind of list creation for the industry. And whether it's fastest growing or um, you name it, you can, you can, you can slice and dice and get that information through 
uh, the resources available there. But, you know, the best company for her was companies that are having fast growth. Becoming an employer of choice, becoming a, an employer of record will attract those kinds of, not employer of record, but it'll attract that top talent to your organization. A lot of that is your digital strategy and, you know, how you are sharing your company's success and, you know, using the tools that are available to you. Even Me Derby has a really aggressive um, digital strategy. We are posting, we are putting out lots of um, really solid content, a lot of original content, a lot of shared content. And it's just creating um, subject matter expertise that attracts people to your organization. So a couple of tips. And Jim, you know, we um, you you bring up the point of onboarding. And so you've gotten through the hire process. You've selected a candidate, made an offer. They're starting that onboarding period and continued throughout, you know, in some cases, their first year of employment, if not further is critical to that person's success. You can't expect somebody to just step into your environment and be successful without, you know, a set go-to person to go to when they have a question and following them, really understanding, you know, what they're doing that first week, second week, third week, who's touching base with them, who's looking at what they're doing and helping them through that. I have somebody right now that I'm a mentor to and she is trying to be part of a speaker series and her whole series is on and she's a salesperson by trade in the industry now to the industry talking about in her experience where she's had poor onboarding and where she's had good onboarding and how it has affected her sales number and productivity so she's in a situation right now where she's got amazing mentoring in her own company. You know, the onboarding was great. She's got, you know, continued following of her career and she's the number two salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, hey, hey, there's so many things that go into success in any of these roles. And it's, um, I mean, you, you take a look at, you know, I use the Bill Belichick, as much as it pains me as a Buffalo Bills fan to talk about Bill Belichick, but, but, you know, he was fired at the Browns with, with the Cleveland Browns and then uh, ultimately wound up at the Patriots and, you know, one of, if not arguably the greatest uh, NFL coach of all time had to find the right fit, had to have the right organization, the right support, had to have the right team having Tom Brady helped, but um yeah, you have to have you have to have the right environment too. It's not just that you can find the absolute perfect person in any of these positions, but if you don't give them the resources, if you don't give them the direction, if you don't give them uh, the support, if you don't give them all those other things, then it's not it's not going to matter. I also find that, particularly on the sales side, we overestimate what the salesperson knows. We overestimate that the salesperson actually knows what to do uh, because. If we look at it, almost none of these organizations formally and properly train people on how to sell. And so where do they pick it up? Well, they just pick it up because they watched so-and-so do it and picked up their bad habits. Uh, they did trial and error. Maybe they don't know. And um, so, you know, it, it's really important not just to get the right person in there, but also to have performance metrics, to have a comp plan that, that makes sense, to have an onboarding process where they can get up to speed quickly and they can get going. Uh, I've, I've seen onboarding where there is no formal onboarding, but they let them drag on for two months doing nothing. And then they go, well, they haven't done anything. You go, well, it's because your, your process did nothing, right? You, you encourage them to do nothing. Spot on. Yeah. yeah, the analogy I always use is like that of Google Maps. You know, it's so uh, there. I don't know. Does that qualify for another one? Not yet. No, oh, no, okay. it's not All an right. adage. No. Okay, sorry. So Google Maps. So what we do as a company is we, you know, have behavioral based profiles that that understand the behaviors exactly where somebody's at um, across six hundred different competencies, but it's all bespoke to what. It, that's where the importance of having, knowing where you're going is so important, right? And so the Google map analogy is if we can understand where somebody is right now, but we have a clear expectation of where they need to go, 
voila, for Google Maps, it'll tell you exactly how many minutes it'll take. For some people, that could be a really short trip, you know, mm -hmm. and for other people, it's, you know, halfway around the country. So it's a longer journey. So the manager needs to appreciate where that person is and then help them get to those to those uh, milestones. And exactly as you're saying, Tom, if they don't know, if they're not in the game helping them and there's no clear destination, you can drive around aimlessly. And there's just, okay. you know, even if you know what that person is like, if you're not helping them get to their destination, um, it's just... You know, it's I've seen that time and again, and it's just really sad. And then you get in all the frustrations and people leave anyway. So, yeah, you know. uh, Jim, I'll stay with you for a second. Um, yeah, we've been uh, you mentioned it on your intro. You know, we've been partnering for, you know, I think, like 12, 13 years now. And and your assessment tool has become integral into my consulting, uh, everything we do. And um you know, it's to me, it is just like one other piece of the puzzle to kind of, but it's a quantifiable piece of the puzzle. Can you just explain maybe a little bit? What I find is I there are a lot of people out there that are skeptical of assessments that are star maybe they've used an assessment that they didn't get the results they wanted to. Um, can you talk just a little bit about maybe just behavioral assessments in general and and then also, how yours is structured. Cause I think yours is unique compared to some other ones. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a very uh, noisy world. As I say, it only, it goes back to 1928, Carl Young, Myers Briggs has been around. It's a, a mom and daughter kind of a thing that grew up and then you have disc and it, you have a lot of these other profiles the the thing is you have to start whittling them back and so are you it, and so the first big whittle is are you looking at personality like a myers briggs or a disc which really doesn't change or are you looking at behaviors that in our world where ours is based off the back of the big 5 personality profile probably the gold standard if you wiki it you'll see all the different technology around it so my team and I, we really built, you know, what we call the best mousetrap, you know, which in other words, you have to have a, something that's very accurate. And so accurate and predictable, is this something that gets the results you need? Because if you only deal with four quadrants or um, in some cases, um, like strengths finders, they have their own language. Well, how does that work? If every company, is, every job's unique, because every company is unique, how do you make that into something you want. So that first thing is predictability. Then you have to have the customization of how do I make it mine? And that's what People Best does very well. We've been bespoke since developing solutions for you, Tom, for 12 years as well, but for clients ever since day one. And then does it scale? And um, can you can you start to use it with other things? Does it measure culture? It, you know, so you have to kind of break out of that mindset of if it's job only, then a lot of times, you know, you have to put it on the shelf because it doesn't transcend into anything else. And then can you get uh, smarter as you go, which is that fourth step, which we're, which I talked about as well, where the data starts to you know, uh, play into each other, you know, from job applications to interview questions to why did people leave? That's why when we talk about some pretty audacious claims of we can predict how much somebody will sell in their first year or how many days they're going to stay on a job. We've been with a lot of clients for a good number of years where we have that data. Um, and so that data should get better and stronger over time. So I think if you're looking at a profile, you have to kind of put it through those measurements. Um, otherwise, why else would you use it? Yeah. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I, um, you know, we've, we've put a couple thousand people at this point or more through the assessment. And um, there's, a, there's a, a section of it that has where you can do some analytics and you can do team, you can compare people in the same team, you can, slice and dice it different ways, break it down. And it's amazing how many times we see in its quadrants, these different quadrants and where all the people fall, uh, you see 
um, very distinct pattern sometimes, and sometimes you see no pattern at all. And sometimes that's a, a deliberate, um, you know, intentional thing that, Hey, we are hiring for a profile. And I think other times it, it kind of exposes a recruiting bias that we tend to like these types of people with these types of, of behavioral traits. And so then once you see that, you can start to really say, okay, is that, this is what we've been recruiting. Is it yielding the results? And then to your point a while earlier, Jim is, is to say, well, what are our star performers doing? Where are they on that? And are they, and a lot of times the star performers are off to the side from where most of the people we're hiring are. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating area that I, I frankly, um, I, I struggle. I get a little bit of anxiety when I'm working with my clients on employee issues and don't have that. I feel like it's a blind spot. So, you know, if I don't have an assessment uh, for somebody. So it's a, and Jim and Tom, I think that plays nicely into the question that I asked before we started, which was, if you're a firm that you are using assessments and you've been able to look at, you know, pull out this group, like you said, in this quadrant that are your star performers, you know, are you following those performers, a, you know, six months in, a year in, and looking at those assessments to make sure that the assessment is on target? Like if they scored this on this assessment, like Jim said, are they really selling this at the end of 12 months? Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and if you can do that, then one of two things. One, the internal process isn't working. Or second, you definitely have to hire a company like ours for not doing their job. Because that's, in, in fact, we have true ups with our clients because of that, uh, Kim, every year. And so we measure uh, who's left, who's stayed, what are those metrics and why? Because um, we have all kinds of other really fascinating stories. There's no, you know, success. Uh, we we find two paths to success. We have the outgoing, uh, extroverted person that kind of charms people into business, and then we have the stalwart, steady guy that is just maniacal about detail and follow up, and so he exudes trust and confidence that nothing's going to get by him. And both can be super successful. But you're 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 right. You gotta you gotta watch it. And like I said earlier, that's kind of our hallmark is that concept of smarter as you go. Um, what did we learn? And why did people leave? Sadly, we have a lot of um, as we say, we companies can hire really strong people. We call them, you know, you're hiring an A player into kind of a B role. They're you know they're. Mm -hmm. you, they're they can outgun the what you're asking them to do. So you have to kind of be careful of that as well. But that's a little bit more rare. But, you know, it, it needs to be that kind of perfect fit that grows and learns. Well, in, many, in many cases, I come back to my client with a candidate when I've evaluated, done an analysis, and I go, why would this person want this job? You know, you find there someone... You who is, it, it scores lower in friendliness and empathy and sociability. And you, you go, well, does that person know they're going to be or should be on the phone all day with candidates? That that's like, that's the job. It's, it is, you know, and yet that's going to drain them. Um, and, uh, you know, or, or the fact that they are, very highly schedule oriented or oriented. Yeah, you know, they have to stick to a schedule and you want to stick them into a light industrial bullpen that is chaos most of the day. You're going, you don't know what your day is going to be like, but you know it's going to be different and you know that it's not going to be scheduled. Yeah. You know, do you really want to put somebody into that uh who is, yeah, you know, just for for their own sake is not yeah. going to be a good fit. Tom, Tom, can I throw in pro tip number four or five? Wherever sure, we're at. sure, sure. So the thing that we always look at is what we call the three-legged stool of hiring. Um, one is um and, and only we only have one, and that's us. Uh, but the other two are can they have they done it before? Do they have a track record? Not necessarily a book of business, because you don't need that, but do they have some type of history 
that exudes confidence that they can do the job. And then second, how do they appear? You know, do they have that presence? Um, do they come in and, um, you know, just kind of blow past the receptionist and, you know, and treat people in different ways? Um, are they respectful? Things like that. And the third one is what the other two can't do, and that's see inside people. And Tom, as you were talking, that's what was triggering. And, and you know, like, do they really know? Like, are they even built for this? Because I don't see it. And so all those questions are, show me a time that you've been able to, you know, uh, do 20, 30, 50, 60 calls a day. And, you know, how do you keep yourself motivated? And all those other behavioral based questions that we actually yeah. just give a map for because we show the biggest risk. So yeah, the top five, but. And Tom, but yeah. I had a question earlier, uh, which was in the majority, the majority of staffing companies are small under 10 million in sales. And so you don't have a big population of salespeople or recruiters to go in and do assessments on. So you can isolate what those, you know, top performers assessments are going to look like. Have you created for the work that you do assessments yeah. that are going to shine for the top production, uh, whether it's recruiters or sales, people that are going to have the biggest potential, the highest likelihood of success. Yeah. So we, you know, we've, we've worked with people best to, to um, identify competencies that are the most predictive. Mm -hmm. And, um, and over the course of time, you, you just start to see certain behavioral traits that are much more, that you, some of them are, are almost, I don't want to say requirements, but, but foundational, they really, you're going to have a tough time overcoming it if you don't have certain types of, of behavioral traits. So we've identified those over, over the years and you know most of the companies that we work with you know they they only do they only do a handful of hiring a year right? we talked right. about this before they're less than 10 million so internal staff they've got maybe 10 15 people and so they're hiring three to five people so it's not a, a, a large sample size so we can take that compared to what others have done um you know it's um but yes, there are, there are definitely certain types of behavioral traits that ser that set people up to have a better chance of success. We've seen people buck the trend. The other the other thing that we've seen though is that um, we've seen it a lot where we've had clients come back and go, "Well, so and so didn't score very well on the assessment, but they're doing great." And then six months later, they're gone. And it was like, so I tell people all the time, I go, "Listen, if somebody is pretty pretty sharp and pretty motivated." They can do a good job at just about any job for a while, but it wears on them if they don't have those those traits that are supportive over the long haul. So, and this really goes to you know it's not just about the behavioral assessments. I know we've we've spent a fair amount of time talking about that. It really just goes to the the idea of hiring based on traits as opposed to experience. We find a lot of times that people overvalue. Uh, certain types of experience and yeah the the holy grail of it is you get the experience and the behavioral traits but one of the things that i say to uh, a lot of my clients is i go okay take the staffing experience out of this would you hire this person mm -hmm. and if they say well i don't know or no then i go well then why are you valuing that so much more than everything else Especially when we know that the staffing industry does a pretty crappy job overall of training people, and it's it's going to be probably a different thing anyways. So, um, you know, I I'm a huge believer in in looking for behavioral traits, personality traits. You know, what what is it that does this person have the right attributes to be successful? And we also see that too when you know we've started more and more working with clients to build their own teams, create career pathing within the organization, bring them in at an entry level, and but bring them in with the right behavioral traits that are most predictive of success and then move them up. And we've seen huge success with that. We've seen great results. We've seen people get up to speed faster. We've seen people hit their gross profit dollar numbers on the recruiting side and on the sales side quicker. So um, so that's, that's one of the things that, that we've seen. And then can you then also predict success in that transition from recruiter 
to recruiting manager, from sales to sales leader, or into management. Because not everybody, just because you're successful on as an individual contributor does not mean you'll be successful in a managerial role. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you're looking at, do they have the the behavioral traits and competencies to be successful in this different role? Because as, as we all know on this call, you know, lots of companies try and turn their best salesperson into a sales manager. In a lot of cases, what made them a good sales person is not going to make them a good manager. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely see that and look at that. Let, let me ask um, uh, Robin and Kim, what are the primary reasons why your clients come to you for help? Because obviously they could, they could do it on their own. Many of them do it on their own. Why is it they come to you? They um, could do it on their own, but I think they, they come to us because, yes, Tom, they have recruiters and salespeople and they, they could recruit, but what they don't have is the staffing industry network. So if our client is asking for staffing industry experience yeah, and they're a nursing staffing firm, they don't have the staffing industry network. They have the nursing network. Yeah. And so they come to us for that staffing industry network and for that expertise and in a lot of cases, our clients come to us because they don't have the internal talent acquisition. You know, we do a lot yeah. of work with privately held firms that don't have an, their own internal talent acquisition team. So they are truly looking at us as their partner. Right. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I, and I, I agree. agree. It's that access to talent that is so critical. Uh, yeah. So important. And also, you know, a lot of these searches are confidential. And so they're not interested in anybody in their organization, even their internal TA, knowing that they've got uh, an internal uh, an internal confidential search. Yeah. I, I also, um, you know, I always cringe when somebody talks about, boy, I really need a sales rep. I'm going to post it on Indeed. And it's, it, it you know, in, indeed, I'm not trying to bash Indeed, but but Indeed should not be your entire recruiting strategy. Nothing should be your entire recruiting strategy, right? Um, you know, you've got 100% of the talent pool out there. Well, only about 13% of them are going to be on Indeed. So you're immediately eliminating 87%. Um, or, or, you know, somebody's casually going out onto LinkedIn, but not realizing the amount of time it takes to really go out there and go after people that first of all, know what you're looking for and then spend that time to go after it. So, uh, so that's, that's, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of that. So um, we got a few minutes. I don't have any questions. Anybody have any questions, feel free to post them um, and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk about compensation real quick. Um, not necessarily specific things around comp, but other than what are you seeing out there? What's the trends? Um, what are you seeing? Well, compensation has always been such an important reason that can, candidates, you don't want it to be the only reason they're considering making a change. We, for the most part, are working with people who are looking to elevate in their careers. And elevation means a lot of things. It means increased opportunity. It means a voice. It means an opportunity to possibly on, be on a, a leadership team in an organization. But compensation is critical to in, in, in making that higher. So um, we are huge fans of looking at your compensation on a regular basis. Don't change your compensation across your organization very often, but make sure you know what is competitive. Having um, uh, bonus plans or commission plans that are uncapped continue to be really important. You know, there are salary bans and there are, so you can't be asking candidates what they're making, but it's really important. And this is something, again, why companies will use a third party. We will ask and we will get information just about what they're looking for. And so we're able to really advise our client and advise the candidate as they're going through this interview process. So that by the time they get to offer, that candidate is pretty close to accept. And I think it's important that your, your compensation plans are very straightforward, are easy to understand. You should never have somebody on your team that doesn't know how they're getting paid or, you know, understand how the commission is structured. Yeah. Well, and if somebody's making a job change, very often um, a client, a company is going to have to create a kind of guarantee or a bridge 
to get them from where they are today to where they're going to be in your company because they're not going to leave money on the table. Right. It doesn't make sense for them. And so that's super important to get into those weeds to understand what people really do need. And if you have really vetted this person, if you've done, if you know what you want, if you're asking the right questions, if you're looking for the right things, and you really believe this person is going to be an asset to your organization, don't nickel and dime on the offer. Correct. It's, it's like I, there, there's, there are some people that, that cannot fight the urge to negotiate. And it's like, it's like, you know, secure this person. They are, uh, they are in demand. They're very good. Let's just go ahead and do it. Don't worry about a couple thousand bucks or whatever. But, um, you know, we see that happen quite a bit. And it's not just compensation, Tom. There's, it's, you know, it's the entire package. I mean, the benefits are really important. The flexibility in the job has never been more important. The, you know, the way somebody's going to office, whether it's remote or hybrid or in office, continues to be, you know, really important on the candidate side. Um, you, and a real call back to office on, you know, in the company, in, in the case of companies. And long-term incentive or profit sharing or, you know, that cherry on top that is really going to, a lot of candidates will not make a job change if there's not some piece of compensation out there that is tied to a long-term incentive or some equity-like plan, particularly right. more senior candidates. I was going to ask well, and you, Tom, did, I'll just, you I'll did you look into the, the question? Q &A? Yeah. yeah, I'll jump to the question. Well, let me um, let me let me read it out first. Yep. So, so the question is, Robin teed it up here. What have you seen? How quickly new hires can come up to speed being remote versus on site? What have you seen companies that get candidates up to speed quickly in a fully remote environment? Well, we can speak to that because we are a fully remote environment and have been fully remote for. 13 years now. And so in a fully remote environment, part of that goes back to the onboarding. You got to make sure that your onboarding is on cue. And when you deviate from your onboarding is when you start to see, you know, production kind of fall off the map, in my opinion. And so staying true to your onboarding, making sure that there are multiple touch points, making sure that you are following that person's activity on a weekly basis that they have multiple touch points within the company to reach out to and that they're encouraged to do that and that you don't deviate from those touch points you know one of the things that we see happen happen often is you know meeting with your staff on a regular basis you know i i still do one on ones with everybody that reports to me every week and I don't change the appointments and I don't reschedule and I don't miss the appointments. And that correlates to the success of the person because that's their time to come ask you questions and tell you where they're stuck. And that's your opportunity to help get them unstuck. Yeah. Jim? Jim? Yeah, I was going to say, um, we have a client that says, uh, we don't measure hours, we measure results. And okay. I think that's just perfect in this, in the search environment. We also have another client that is heavily call center oriented. So they need people that will be there at 759, not 801. And so there's a lot of specificity. Um, but we find that exactly as Kim was saying, those companies that set objectives and don't nickel and dime, so to speak. You know, I don't care, you know, because we all have priorities. That's why, you know, um, a vast majority of people love working from home and remote because they're going to be very fast and, you know, strong at what they do, but they're also going to throw a load of wash in the dryer, you know, you know, a load of clothes in the washer and stuff. But it's really, um, it's being clear on the expectations is really what it is. The yeah. second thing is, is you also, we also have a competency called uh, working remote. And so don't underestimate the fact that some people are wired for it and others are not. Yeah. So you can have a lot of great expectations, but if people are hyper um, collaborative and they like to be around people and things like that, you're, you're going to want to know those things first. Otherwise um, you're, you know, you're dead on the runway. That's a uh, it's a great point. Um, I want to get to the last question here before we're finished. We've got about five minutes left. Um, but before I get to that question, 
I was just talking to a president of a company last week that literally walks down the street from his house to go to a co-working location because he will tell you he cannot work from home. And, and there are certain people that can work well from home. There are others that it becomes more of a distraction. And then there's people in between, you know, the, which is why hybrid such a good thing. It's a nice, it's a nice mix of that. Um, you know, uh, as far as I, I would say, from my perspective, I have clients that are in the office all the time. I have clients that are, are remote. I have clients that are hybrid. Um, the question that Jared asked about, you know, what have you seen as far as people ramping up? It, it, to me, it's less about the location. It's more about what are the requirements and do you hold people to it? And do you show them the path to success? Now, are you showing them a way to get to it? Do they have the resources? Um, that, you know, that's the more important piece to it. And to add to what Jim said is, you know, somebody who thrives in a remote environment is going to do better than they would. Their production is going to be better than they would sitting in an office five days a week. Even even the environments within the office, a bullpen environment versus an office environment, very different for different people, and you'll get different results. Right. So, um, last question that we have, and then we'll we'll wrap up here. We've got like two minutes to answer this, but I, I wanted to get to Brad. Hi, Brad. Um, Great content. Okay. Uh, that, can you shed some light on hiring corporate recruiters into the agency space and what areas besides a maybe urgency that should be focused on during onboarding or training? I'll take that one. I'll start okay. with that one. Okay. I, I think when you're hiring somebody from corporate, some of the questions that you need to ask is, you know, are you truly recruiting or are you just receiving candidates that come into the company's job board? Because there's a huge difference, and that's where you see corporate recruiters that come into agency really struggle because they're called a corporate recruiter, but in a lot of cases, they're just following up on job applications. Yeah. So they're not truly recruiting the candidates. So that's, you know, a little bit of it has to start in the interview process and making sure that they understand truly how to recruit and what their metrics are. Uh, and I'll add two things. One is that we have candidates do a recruiting project. And so we give them a, you know, a specific job we want them to recruit on and they come back with candidates that they've sourced. And so we're able to then cross-reference to see how applicable they are. But also our top recruiter was a corporate recruiter before she came to be Derby. Now she was a corporate recruiter for a staffing company, but you know, the, the correlation was in that particular case, seamless and, you know, she has thrived. I do yeah. think knowing what your model is and hiring to the model back to you, Tom, whether it's corporate, I mean, in-house, remote or hybrid. And some people like myself, I am a highly extroverted, but I have, and I've thrived in, a, in an office, but I've thrived in a corporate, I mean, in a remote environment, we've created an incredibly collaborative organization. Kim talked about the one-on-ones, but we have two other meetings a week that are all hands on deck. And we have lots of times and points uh, throughout the, co the course of a year, conferences, retreats, co-working times together. So you can create these different ways to connect that, you know, are going to support the organization, support the people that can be alternative to any one of those full in-office, remote or hybrid environments. Great. I want to thank you all. Um, this has been a great discussion. The hour flew by. I, I really appreciate it. Jeff, I see your um, your question about what would you consider a reasonable time frame for an entry-level recruiter to become a profit become profitable? I'll give you the 10-second answer. Six months to get fully ramped up, about three months to start to be profitable. So that's the quick one. If you need more detail, reach out to me, Jeff. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So, uh, if you missed any of our past episodes or want to revisit them, you can find recordings of our discussions on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. This will be out there uh, here in the next week or so. You can sign up for our next Staffing in Sync as well as access a video library of our past sessions on our website, staffinginsync.com. Staffing in Sync is produced and sponsored by HR Logics, the top provider of Affordable Care Act compliance for the staffing industry and Essential Staff Care, the largest, largest provider of health care insurance and benefits for the staffing industry. Thank you so much for, uh, for putting on this podcast. 
Uh, and thank you all again for your support. We look forward to having you again on the next Staffing Instinct. Thank you to our guests. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Bye. Bye.